if we look at uh, the troop contributing countries mm -hmm. and sort of the kind of uh, training that they go through, how prepared are these troops? Um, how adequate is uh, their training and their force structure to the peace enforcement uh, or stabilization uh, environment? That raises an important question as well, yeah, because our training regimes need to be linked to what we think are the primary purposes of, of peace operations. And again, in the African context, part of the debate here is that different institutions have different philosophies of peace operations. So the United Nations, on the one hand, talks explicitly about peacekeeping operations. And as a result, its training regimes are set up to teach peacekeepers to perform the certain peacekeeping tasks that we traditionally expect. Whereas the African Union, for example, talks explicitly about peace support operations and sometimes at least has a, a much broader idea of the notion of operations that fall under that umbrella. And they can include you know, forcibly making peace when there's not a, a peace settlement already made. So the training tasks for these two different types of um, missions might be um, quite variable. Uh, a good example of this would be the African Union mission in Somalia where in Mogadishu in early 2007, the African Union decided it wanted to, de to deploy a peace support operation to help um, support and prop up the transitional federal government in Somalia. But the UN decided that this was not the right place or, or circumstance to deploy a, a peacekeeping mission. So the, the training regimes have to, to some degree, reflect the different philosophies of um, peacekeeping versus broader peace support operations. And I would say in recent years, probably two or three main issues have stood out as being important for the training. Uh, number one would be civilian protection tasks. Uh, we've had a debate for at least a decade or so now about what exactly do we mean by civilian protection and what are the military and policing tasks that flow from that and how can, then can we train our, our personnel to respond to those um, tasks. A second set of issues I would say is to do with policing and the rule of law. Increasingly, we've asked peacekeeping operations to, in their mandates, get involved in domestic rule of law and governance issues. And this has meant uh, there's been a much bigger role for police officers to play, as opposed to uh, primarily soldiers. So this means that both police have to be um, a much bigger part of our training, which has traditionally focused on militaries when it comes to peacekeeping. And then a, a third area, I suppose, more recently, um, which unfortunately has been shown in the theatres, particularly in Somalia and, and northern Mali, uh, is preparing for asymmetric threats and um, particularly counter IED um, threats. So a much larger part of the contemporary peace operations in Africa are facing these different types of asymmetric threats of which IEDs would be a particularly important um, element. And as a result, training regimes are going to have to um, catch up with those types of problems. So it would have been almost, I think, inconceivable even, even 15 years ago that a major part of a peacekeeping training regime might have to involve counter IED training. But as we've seen from missions like MINUSMA in, in northern Mali, that's probably increasingly going to be an important part of the agenda.